Well, good morning. My name is Tori Jaspers. I get to serve on the team here at Christ Church, and uh, I'm so glad we have a chance to gather together. Being together as a church is such a sweet gift from God. I'm glad that God did not design the church to be us fragmented in our own homes, but we get to be together and do life together. And if you're a guest with us today, we're so glad that you joined us in our family gathering. We hope it'll be a blessing to you. And uh, we look forward to getting to know you a little bit better. We here at Christ Church work our way through the, uh, through the Word of God. And as Pastor Adam often says, line by line, paragraph by paragraph. So we would ask you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of John. If you don't have a Bible, you are welcome to take a Bible that is in the chair in front of you. And uh, you can use that this morning. If you don't have a Bible, take that as a gift from us. And uh, we're going to be looking at John 20. We are in a series called Life in His Name. And in this book, we have been discovering who Jesus is. That He is God, fully God, has always been God, will always be God, and He is the Messiah. And last week we were in John 20, verses 19 through 23, where we saw Jesus enter into the room with the 10 apostles the evening of Resurrection Sunday or Easter Sunday. Now we're going to move into another scene that is very similar to it. It is another scene, though, that has a very specific and unique purpose. Has there ever been a time in your life where you experienced something so deeply disappointing that it actually left you disillusioned, more than discouraged? Yes, discouraged, but more than discouraged, but disillusioned. By that, I mean where you're at a place where you're you're not sure what you think. You're not sure what you believe. You're not sure what is true. You're not, you're just not sure of, of anything. You're disillusioned. Maybe it happened as a child when you discovered, and I'm going to try and speak in code here because there might be children in the room and I don't want to be the one to destroy this, but there's a certain jolly fat man with a beard (laughs) that you clung to with great joy, love, and hope. And you found out actually it was your weird uncle wearing a costume That can be a little disillusioning. It kind of changes the entire season, doesn't it? Or maybe there was a sports personality that you just loved and you followed. I mean, you knew knew their stats when they played Little League in fourth grade. You have followed their entire career and and you've cheered them on. and, And all of a sudden, the news comes out that they won the race They hit the home runs because they were actually cheating. They had a little something extra. You're so, it's more than disappointed. It's it's more than discouraged. It's disillusioned. You tear the posters off the wall. You, You throw the tickets into the trash. You maybe even walk away from the sport and say, nah, I'm not even interested in following that sport anymore. Maybe you found a politician. And you are absolutely surprised that there was a politician who was speaking about a value that you care deeply about. And this politician courageously and, 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 and uh, clearly was, was talking about that same value. And you're like, that's amazing. Here's somebody who shares a value with me. And so you get on the bandwagon and you, and you support them and you promote them. And you put signs out in your yard if your HOA allows it. Or maybe you do anyhow because you're the rebel in the HOA. I don't know. You put a bumper sticker on your car that you later regret. And then... Once elected, you find out that in a closed committee meeting, when the pressure was on and their, the survivability of their career was at stake, they caved. They sacrificed that core value they had talked about that you shared in common. They gave it away. They gave it up in order to protect their own career. And this leaves you hurting and disillusioned. Or maybe there was that preacher or author 
I mean, your life has been deeply impacted by their preaching. You read their books and, and your life, you do life differently. You saw life differently because of what they preached and because of what they wrote. And, and you were so joyful of their life and ministry. And then suddenly you found out that there was a scandal. They are a fraud, a fake a charlatan, maybe they even walk away from the faith. And this leaves you hurting, spiritually disoriented. Was any of this really true? What do I really believe? What is really true? And you are painfully disillusioned, maybe even feeling lost. We're going to look at a man this morning who is suffering from deep hurt and disillusionment. And we're going to see that in our text of John 20, verses 24 down through verse 31. Our title of our message this morning is There's Still Hope. There's Still Hope. I want you to know that this morning. If you came in this morning, I want you to know there's still hope. Let's see it in the Word of God. Follow along quietly, if you would, as I read, beginning in verse 24. Now, Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I'll never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, put out your hand, place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. If we were to take this portion of scripture and we were to state it in one sentence, this is what it would be. This would be the big idea of the message this morning. Even in the face of unbelief, hope lives because Jesus is alive. So we want to ask a question about that statement. It is this, why does hope live in the face of unbelief? And we're going to look at there are three reasons for hope, and each one is going to begin this way, because Jesus is alive. And here's the first one, because Jesus is alive, there is a saving object of belief. We look here at verse 24, and we see Thomas is introduced into the narrative, into the story. Now, let's just take a moment and see who Thomas is you probably know Thomas by the phrase, doubting Thomas. You might think of him as, as being distant from the Lord. You might think of him as being an individual that wasn't really close with the Lord. And, and if that's your view of Thomas, you don't really understand him as the scripture portrays him. There's not a lot given to us in scripture about the life of Thomas, but when we see him, I like what I see. If you look in John chapter 11, verse 16, Jesus is going to go and he's going to enter into arm's reach of the religious leaders that have said, we want to find him and we want to kill him. And, and people are saying, Jesus, don't go. And not Thomas. Thomas says the opposite. He says, no, 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 no. Let's go with him and maybe we'll die with him. That wasn't a promise, a problem for Thomas. He loved Jesus and he was willing to follow Jesus, even if it meant the cost of his life. Later in John 14, as Jesus was giving his last instructions, he says to Thomas, now you, you, to all of the disciples, he says, now you know where I'm going and, and you know how I'm, I'm going to do that. And Thomas pipes up and he goes, no, well, hold on a moment. Time out. 
actually, we really don't know where you're going and we certainly don't know the way. And it set up for Jesus to give that glorious verse in John chapter 14 and verse six, where he said, I am the way, I am the truth and the life and no man comes to the father, but by me. It, it is true that Thomas maybe was a little bit of a, of a, uh, of a cynical he maybe was an individual who was a little bit of the Eeyore, a pessimist, but he loved Jesus and he followed Jesus with all of his heart and, and he was willing to sacrifice greatly for Jesus. That's the Thomas that we're talking about. He's one of the 12. Of course, it's now down to 11 because Judas is now gone and he's called the twin. That's his nickname. He's, he's, uh, he's called the twin because he's a twin. And uh, I think it's really an original nickname there. Somebody sat up all night thinking of that nickname. But he had not been with the others when Jesus entered into the room on Easter night. And the other disciples who were in that room who saw Jesus when he entered in, they, they, when they saw Thomas next, they kept telling him this. We have seen the Lord. Thomas, I've got great news for you. Thomas, we have seen the Lord you got to believe this. And Thomas says to them, unless I touch and unless I see his wounds, notice if you would there at verse 25, he says, I will never believe. That phrase, I will never believe, actually has a double negative to it. It basically he is saying, there is no way I will ever, no, never believe. And it's, it's very important for us that we feel with Thomas here. Thomas has been through a deeply traumatic experience. He has witnessed the death of his friend. He has experienced the, the sudden crash of a cause that he believed in. It was traumatic because he loved Jesus deeply. Thomas did not have an unusually weak faith. I want you to notice this. It was not wrong for Thomas to say, I want to see to believe. In fact, if you go up to verse 20, you'll see that's what happened with the other 10. Jesus entered into the room, and when he had said this, he showed them his hands, and he showed them his side. And what happened? The disciples were glad. They believed because they saw the Lord. Now, they believed because they saw, so it can't now be wrong for Thomas to desire to see in order to believe. In fact, it's important for us to understand, and we're gonna to get to this later, they had to see because they were Jesus's witnesses. And in order to be qualified as a witness, they had to see. But as we look at this, it is important for us to know that Thomas was not willing to settle for some type of a weak faith. He, he wasn't willing to just settle for, I, I saw I saw a vision of Jesus, Thomas. He's like, yeah, that's fine for you, but I need something more than a vision of Jesus. I saw the ghost of Jesus, Thomas. Yeah, yeah, that's great for you, but I'm not, that's not good enough for me. I saw an apparition of Jesus. Yeah, no, no, no. Thomas is saying, here's what he's saying when he says, unless I see and touch, he is saying this, there's only one thing that will satisfy my belief, and that is in a literal, physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That's the only object I will trust. This is Thomas wanting to make certain that the object of his faith is dependable. So we see here in verse 26, eight days later, probably if you were to do the days here in a Jewish fashion, this is probably the next Sunday. His disciples were inside again and Thomas was now with them. Doors again are locked. We were reminded that the door, doors are locked back in the previous paragraph because they were afraid of the Jews. And Jesus came and stood among them miraculously in his glorified body. Jesus just came through a locked door and was suddenly in the middle of his disciples. And Jesus said to them, peace be with you. But then he said to Thomas, he says, I want you to touch my nail scarred hands. I want you to touch my spear pierced side. Thomas, I want you to have proof that I'm not just a spirit. I'm not just a ghost. I'm not just an apparition. Thomas, believe I am really alive. 
John MacArthur says this, the Lord met Thomas at the point of his weakness and doubt without rebuke because he knew that Thomas's error was connected to his profound love and patient compassion. He gave Thomas the empirical proof he had demanded. As I see this, I have to understand, as we see this, we have to understand Jesus is in that room specifically for the purpose of meeting with Thomas. This is a glorious picture of the heart of our Savior. Jesus had set his love on Thomas and he was fully aware of the struggle that Thomas was going through when when he saw his savior die and when they buried his body, he's like, I'm not putting all the pieces together. This is not the way I thought it would work out. I thought we were gonna uh, defeat the Romans. I thought we were gonna be victorious. What is going on? And Jesus, because he is God, knew the disillusionment in Thomas's heart. And so Jesus in love comes and meets with Thomas. This is a love rescue. This is what our Savior does. Our Savior pursues us. Our Savior knows our heart and he loves us even in our weaknesses. He loves us even in our failings. He loves us even in our wonky thinking. He loves us and he pursues us and he wants us to know what is truly true so that we have an object that we can believe that is dependable. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter four, verses 15 and 16, that that Jesus is our high priest that empathizes with us because he was tempted in, in every way as we are, of course, yet without sin. And so when he looks at our life and he knows what we're wrestling through, he understands the struggle it is to be navigating through this earthly journey. I'm reminded also of Psalm 103 and verse 14, where there the Bible tells us that God knows that we are but dust. And he remembers that. He's constantly keeping in in mind that we are frail and fallen and we need a a, a savior as sinners. Jesus has tenderness to our weakness. Jesus has empathy as we struggle to follow. Jesus understands that we are but dust. But now we reach the climax of the book. For 20 chapters, John has been both a storyteller and a lawyer in a courtroom. He has been pursuing one line of thinking That one line of thinking is that you and I would believe that Jesus is God and that he's the promised Messiah. And he is arguing this point by telling story after story after story where he's giving to a sign after sign of who Jesus is, proof after proof. And now we come to the climax of the entire book of John where we see in verse 28, or sorry, at the end of verse 27, Jesus says to him, Do not disbelieve, Thomas, but believe. That literally means, Thomas, stop becoming disbelieving and believe. Jesus in love is arresting Thomas from continuing to live in a status, in a condition, in a place of disbelieving. Scripture doesn't use the word doubt. He uses the word disbelieving. There there sometimes can be in our culture this idea that, you know, a skeptic is quite noble. A skeptic is quite admirable. A skeptic is quite intellectual. To just constantly live in a status of skepticism is admired by our culture. And I, for the life of me, cannot figure out why. To to live your entire life not knowing anything to be true. To live your entire life without anything that you can cling to. To live your entire life ignoring the clear evidences in nature that there has to be a creator. Living your entire life resisting the working of the Holy Spirit. Living your entire life ignoring the life transforming work that God does in lives around you. To live your entire life ignoring the promises of the word of God. Listen, that is not noble. That is not freeing. That's prison. That's living in bondage. 
That's living in hopelessness. And that's the status of Thomas. He's in this condition of being disbelieving. And so in love and in empathy, Jesus does a rescue work. And he comes to Thomas and he rescues Thomas. And he calls him, come out of the condition. Come out of the mindset. Come out of the status of being disbelieving. And Thomas, here's what I want you to do. Believe. Believe. Believe that I am God. Believe that I am the Messiah. Believe in me. Now we see in verse 28, Thomas's, it seems, immediate response because it says that he answered him. It seems to be just an immediate response. And Thomas answered him in verse 28, my Lord and my God. Thomas here is recognizing that there is an object that he truly can believe. He did not want to just have faith in faith, hope in hope, believe nothing for the sake of believing nothing. No, the hope for every believer, there is hope for every believer, not because they believe something. There is hope for every believer because the object of their faith is that Jesus is alive. Thomas gives this glorious confession. There's no evidence that he ever actually demand, that he ever did what he demanded to touch Jesus' hand or side. It seems as though Thomas saw and believed. And Thomas' response, my Lord and my God, is to the person of Jesus Christ. And he saw Jesus as being both his Savior and his Lord. He understood that Jesus was the one that could rescue him from the consequences of being disobedient. And isn't that glorious? No matter how you have failed, sinned, rebelled, transgressed, no matter what you have done in your life that is in a violation of your creator, God, that is in violation of his purposes for your life, it is important to know that In your disobedience and in my disobedience, God loves us. And as Savior, he comes and he rescues us from the consequences of our disobedience. He forgives us. He removes the weight of guilt. What a glorious dimension. As the religious leaders were just saying, you've got to do more. You've got to do more. You've got to do more. And people lived with an increasing weight, Jesus said, of never knowing what their status was with their creator God. Here comes Jesus, and he says, I went to the cross for you. I bore the weight for your sin. I paid it all. I paid it in full. I'm not adding weight to you. I took your weight upon me. Come to me. I will save you. But it's important to understand that we can't merely come to Jesus as the Savior from the consequences of our disobedience, but we also must come to our Savior as the one who rescues us from a heart that wanted to disbelieve in the first place. He rescues us from a heart that wanted to disobey in the first place. There's a heart condition that we have in our fallenness that wants to shake our fist in the face of God. There is a condition in our fallenness that wants to, if God says, do this to turn and do our own thing. There is a rebellious nature in our fallen flesh. And Jesus comes and he is to be our savior, rescuing us from the consequences and the guilt of being disobedient. But he is also our Lord, the one who now begins to call the shots and he rescues us from a heart that wants to disobey God. For Thomas, Jesus was not just a good man. He was not just a wise teacher. He was not just a prophet. He was not a political revolutionary. Jesus was God who saves me. And that was the object of his faith. See, it's important for us to understand that the key to our faith is not merely that we have faith. The key to our faith is what is the object of our faith? I moved here to Arizona from Colorado, where we lived in Colorado was, ne- was very near the airport. And so at that airport was a parachuting school. So most days, if it was clear at all, there would be airplanes that would be slowly circling, climbing up 
to a high altitude, which is pretty high in Colorado above the ground. And when they would get up to that altitude, all of a sudden you'd watch and people would just fling themselves out of a perfectly good airplane. I want you to know, those people did not fling themselves out of a perfectly good airplane thoughtlessly. They had, each one of them, an object that they were depending on. The key to their survivability was the legitimacy of the object they were depending on. If somebody had come to them before the flight and said, "Um, here's a magic crayon. And if you hold onto this magic crayon, it's a special color. You hold on to this magic crayon. When you fling yourself out of a perfectly good airplane, which I do not understand, this magic crayon is going to protect your life. Could a person believe in that magic crayon? Absolutely. Could they believe it sincerely? Absolutely. There's just one problem. Crayons don't save you from falling out of an an airplane and we don't want to talk about the rest. At some point, those people before they flung themselves out of the airplane, came to understand that there is a harness that is made of of strong material and there are cords that are able to withstand the jerk of a body in free fall coming nearly to a stop in one moment. There is a a parachute that has the ability to hold their weight. There is a ripcord that will actually release all of this and they became convinced that the object of their faith was worth trusting their very life with and they did. They were not leaping into the unknown. They were trusting an object, and that is the parachute. It's important for us to understand that we have an object for our faith, and it is the most legitimate, trustworthy object that we could ever cling to with our earthly and our eternal existence. And it is this God became man, Jesus Christ, lived a perfect life, died only because he is paying for our sin, and God raised him from the dead, victorious over sin, and because Jesus is alive, we have hope. There's an object for our belief. If you're here today and you say, Tori, I, I don't... I, I, This is new for me. I want you to know this. Because of Thomas's confession, you can know what a confession of a heart that truly sees Jesus as the object of of their faith says. That heart says, Jesus, you're my Lord and you're my God. So I would urge you, He's the only object of faith that is able to give you new life. He's the only object of faith that is able to give you eternal life. He's the only object of faith that knows you personally. He's the only object of faith that loves you sacrificially. He's the only object of faith that has proven to transform lives. He is pursuing you to rescue you from the pit of skepticism and disillusionment that you're living in. And in this moment, you can step from darkness into life as you cling to the object that gives hope, which is Jesus is alive. And if you're a follower of Jesus and you're going through a season of disillusionment, there is still an object for your believing. Are you discouraged because of circumstances? Listen to Jesus' voice. He said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Believer, Jesus is the object for your believing in tribulation. Have people failed you? Then listen to the voice of Jesus from Hebrews 13, where he says, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. Get your eyes off men, other people, fix them on Jesus He is the object for your believing when you've been failed by other humans. Are you feeling the weight of guilt? Listen to Jesus. 1 John 2, 1. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Listen, Jesus is the object for your believing when you are feeling the weight of sin. Because Jesus is alive, there's a saving object of belief. But I want you to know, there's another reason that we have hope to live in the face of unbelief. And it is this, because Jesus is alive, there is a satisfying blessing in belief. 
a satisfying blessing in belief. Look, if you would, at verse 29. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? He now says and pronounces and proclaims and bestows a blessing. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. The blessing is for all of those millions upon millions. After Thomas, after the apostles have lived, the millions upon millions, that includes us, who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, even though we've never physically seen Jesus' body, his resurrected body, Jesus says there is a blessing for us. And that blessing is this, we do get to see, but we see through the enabling eyes of the Holy Spirit and through the word of God, as the Bible tells us in John, that the Holy Spirit does an illuminating work in our minds and heart. We we heard it last week in one of the baptismal services, at least that I was a part of it, where, where the, the believers said, uh, suddenly, it's like the light came on. Well, that's both the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit, and it's also the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. And so we do get to see, we get to see through eyes enabled by the Holy Spirit. There's a blessing for us who have not seen, yet we believe, because this is normal Christianity Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. First Corinthians chapter five and verse seven says, we walk by faith and not by sight. So it's important for us to understand that in this era, there is a blessing. And when we step away from making our demands the way Thomas did, and we submit ourselves to God's will, which is that in this time, we believe by not seeing with physical eyes, but by seeing with Holy Spirit enabled spiritual eyes, the risen Savior. There is a blessing for our faith. Don't be discouraged by that. Just think of the moment, believer, that you came to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Do you remember? It is nothing of you. It was nothing of you. It was all of God. He's the one who came and showed you your weakness. He's the one who came and showed you who Jesus was. He's the one who came and rescued your heart. And there is a working that is done that is so beautiful and glorious and precious because it is all of Jesus. But I want you to know this. There is a day that we will have sight. In Romans in chapter 8 Verses 24 and 25. Actually, I'd like for you to turn there with me if you would. Romans 8, verses 24 and 25. As you're turning, I'd love to hear those pages. I would love for somebody to develop a Bible app that actually has the sound of page turning when you swipe through your app. That'd be glorious for preachers. Romans chapter 8. Track, if you would, with Paul's argument in verse 24. Romans 8, 24. For in this hope, we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? You see the argument Paul is making? We right now live in hope of the promises of God, but there's going to come a day when we are going to see Jesus face to face. And at that point, we no longer live by hope. We will live by sight. We would now walk by faith, not by sight. But when I finally am face to face with my Savior, I no longer walk by faith. I now walk by sight. That there will be a moment where suddenly we will transition from living by hope that is only through faith and we will live rejoicing in hope that is ours because we will see our Savior face to face and we will live with him for eternity, seeing him, worshiping him, fellowshipping with him, getting to know him. I was talking with Brandon Delage this week and he said, Tori, sight is the prize. That's not a very good imitation of Brandon Delage, but you can picture Brandon saying that. Sight is the prize. So we look forward to someday we're going to be able to see our Savior face to face, even though we walk by faith now. And it is the prize that we look forward to. It is the prize that we yearn for. I want you to notice 
There's a third reason why we have hope in the face of unbelief, and it is this. Because Jesus is alive, there is a sufficient record for belief. Notice, if you would, in John chapter 20, verse 30. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, but, notice, which are not written in this book, in the book of John. So what John is saying is there's a lot of other things that Jesus did that the disciples saw, but John did not include them in this book. Why did he not include them? It was because they were not necessary for an individual to come in faith in Christ. He says in verse 31, but these are written for a purpose so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Listen, you may have questions about God and Jesus and eternity and all kinds of things, but I want you to know this. What is written in the book of John is what you need in order to believe. He said, but Tori, I have questions. I was helped this week by some of our staff had an opportunity to sit down with Dr. Wayne Grudem, the eminent theologian on staff at Phoenix Seminary. And he was talking about this very thing. He he said, if if a circle would represent God's revelation, we would have questions outside of that circle. Why would we have questions outside of that circle? Here's why. God is infinite and we're not. So if we experience God increasing the revelation to include the questions that we have, do you know what would happen? We would have more questions outside of that because there's always going to be something beyond our ability to understand because of God's infinite nature and our finite nature. God is not calling us to have all of our questions answered. God is calling us to understand that the record that we have been graciously and lovingly and kindly given through the witnesses of his apostles is eminently trustworthy. And we are to take God at his word. We are to believe the record that God has given to us, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. And notice, and that by believing, you don't just stay the same. That by believing, you don't just continue on as you've always been. No. But by believing, you will have life in his name, a transformed life. We, we see this in the life of Thomas. In love, Jesus pursued Thomas. I mean, we get to see the testimony of the moment that Thomas's life was radically transformed. His deep pain and disillusionment went to powerful, driving hope, changed his life so that Thomas, as church history records, traveled further geographically than any of the other apostles. He went all the way through Iran, at least into India, and possibly even into Indonesia, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, he gave his life as a witness outside of the city that is now Chennai, India. There, they say, is a mound that represents where he was buried. Life was changed. Why was that life changed? That life was changed not because Thomas necessarily had all of his questions answered, That life was changed because the record that he had was sufficient. Notice if you would in 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 8 and 9. You're going to want to jot this reference down. Go back and look at it this week. Bible tells us in 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. And rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. John talked about this in 1 John in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. That's Jesus. They've seen him. They've touched him. Verse 2, the life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are 
writing these things so that our joy may be complete. I would urge you today, I don't, I'm not sure where you are in your faith journey, but take God at his word. I remember trusting Christ in my early teen years, but I doubted my salvation throughout most of my teen years. And it was in college that I came to a moment of crisis where I no longer could live with struggling with knowing whether I am truly saved. And God in his kindness and mercy took me to his word, to passages like John, uh, James chapter one, where he tells me that I am begotten, I'm born again by his working. And I came to know glorious promises like Romans in chapter eight, where we are held in the hands of the savior, which are in the hands of the Father, and in that nail-pierced embrace is where I exist, and nobody can pluck me from the Father's hands. And I understood that my security was not, my assurance would not come because I prayed another prayer. My assurance would come as I would take God at his word, and as I would cling to his promises that God would be who he says that he is, that he would do what he said he would do, and that I can trust him, and he's told me all about it. Well, as we Consider this message. Here's a wonderful truth. Hope still lives for every unbeliever because Jesus is alive. Learning to live. What are the learning to live takeaway points that we can use for this text of scripture this week? Number one, believe the gospel. If you have never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I would urge you as I've done throughout the message this morning, take God at his word, believe that Jesus is alive from the dead. He is your only object of saving hope. Trust him today. Declare with Thomas, my Lord and my God. And if you say, well, I have trusted Christ as my savior, but I I have struggled with discouragement and disillusionment, here's a second takeaway learning to live point, and it is this, believe the gospel again. Believe the gospel again. Just, you don't need something new. You don't need something faddish. You don't need something extra. Just go back to the same truths that have proven trustworthy over and over again and cling to the promises of God because he is trustworthy and his word is true. And then thirdly, believe the gospel and share it. There are people around you who are living as Thomas was in the bondage of disillusionment and what they need is to hear the glorious hope that we have in a risen savior. Believe the gospel and share it. Our father, we come to you this morning in gratitude that you are the God who loves us so deeply that you pursue, it, you pursue us the way you pursued Thomas. Oh, father, we are so grateful for your kindness and your love. And we would pray, father, that you would work in our hearts today Do that work that only you can do and that each of us need. That we would have a steadfast hope in the risen Savior. Oh God, work for your spirit as only you can do. For the glory of your name, we pray this. We ask, Lord, that there would be a transforming work as we believe, as we have life in your name. That we would go and we would be able to share the testimony of our living, the testimony of our proclamation to a world that needs to have steadfast hope. We pray this in Christ's name and for your glory, amen.